programs and benefits that employees want is key to maintaining a high performing and stable workforce. Now, unfortunately, Congress has a longstanding tend tendency to view these kinds of investments as expenses. The focus, in other words, is on costs rather than returns. This is an area where I think Congress really needs to change the way it thinks. Investing in staff pays off and the returns are exponential. Staff with long-term institutional knowledge and deep ties to the communities in which we serve are so essential to making Congress work better for the American people. Instead of treating constant staff turnover as just the way things work on Capitol Hill, Congress should invest in the kinds of benefits and programming that would make a long-term career on the Hill attractive. Whether that's a first time home buyer assistance benefit or a child care subsidy or a college savings plan or better health care options or all of the above, Congress needs to do better. Congress needs to do better because small salary bumps and title changes can't compete with bigger paychecks and better benefits and a healthier work life balance. And that's evidenced by the fact that the typical staffer leaves the Hill after four or five years. The longer Congress ignores the so-called brain drain from Capitol Hill, the harder it becomes for the legislative branch to uphold its Article I responsibilities. And that's a disservice to the American people because what too often fills that void is hired lobbyists. Today, we're going to talk about steps Congress can take to regain a competitive edge in the career marketplace. We'll hear former staff explain why a long-term career on the Hill often isn't sustainable for so many. And we'll also hear from experts focused on empowering staff through mentorships and professional development programs. And we'll learn about the latest in employee benefit trends and how Congress compares. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and to hearing what the experts joining us today recommend. And I'd now like to invite Vice Chair Timmons to share some opening remarks as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today to discuss this very important issue. Uh, in the rules of the House where this select committee was established, it states that this committee's mission is to make Congress more effective, efficient, and transparent on behalf of the American people. There are many ways to achieve this mission, but one of the most important ways to do so is investing in staff, our teams. Our teams are everything. Um, they are the ones who are communicating with constituents on a daily basis, whether it be a staff assistant answering a phone call, a communications director responding to a social media message or comment, or a constituent services representative handling a casework issue. These are the people that are essential to making Congress work better, more effective, more efficient for the American people. Uh, I believe a big part of the reason Congress is viewed as ineffective or dysfunctional is because we do not take the necessary steps to invest in our team members. We have seen numerous companies in the private sector put an emphasis on staff retention, whether that be through a benefits package, continued employee training programs, or just an overall better emphasis on the work-life balance. As the chair said, a, a typical Hill staffer leaves the Hill after three to five years. Sure, there are some that come to the Hill after college just for the experience, knowing they will not be here for more than a year or two, but the majority of staff leave because they simply cannot afford to stay. And I do not just mean financially, it's simply uh, just, it's not sustainable mentally and emotionally. So many staffers uh, become drained and they have to leave. Being Hill staff can be a thankless job. And that is why we must take steps now to foster an environment of learning and growth. Paying a competitive salary may fix some of these problems, but it does not address all of the obstacles that we face. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from today's panel of witnesses, um, upon how uh, recommendations can be made in the 116th and new recommendations to foster a more positive environment for staff so that we can better serve the American people. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, speaking of terrific staff, the terrific staff of this committee put together two A-plus panels of witnesses. Our first panel features three experts on staff professional development and training, and our second panel features four experts who will address staff pay, benefits, and retention. Uh, witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will, will be limited to five minutes and without objection, your written statements will be part of the record. Our first witness is Catherine Spinder, the Chief Administrative Officer for the House of Representatives. Previously, Ms. Spinder served as the Chief Information Officer for the House of Representatives. She joined the House in 2011 as the Director of Enterprise Applications and then was promoted to Deputy CIO and Acting CIO prior, prior to, be named, to being named CIO. Um, that was a lot of CIOs in one sentence. Sorry, Catherine. Um, during her time in the House, she's directed improvements to technology infrastructure and applications, adoption of cloud technologies, and the implementation of collaboration and conferencing tools in support of remote working during the COVID-19 crisis. 
Ms. Spender, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, I appreciate it. Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Timmons, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the CAO's efforts to improve congressional staff retention through our staff training programs. It is also an honor to be here with you and the other panelists. The CAO's motto is member focused service driven, and this drives everything we do. Part of being member focused is also being staff focused. Among more than 100 services the CAO provides to the House, we take great pride in providing the training programs to develop the skill sets that staff need to be successful. We continue to see an enormous need in this area and are committed to stepping up our efforts to provide the most needed and relevant staff training. It is our hope that by better preparing our staff for their work and aiding them to gain confidence and skills needed to succeed, staff will stay on the Hill and become experts and leaders within our institution. CAO training has evolved. Many of you may remember when it was just a few classrooms where you could learn word perfect and other technical skills. However, in 2017, the CA launched a house-focused professional development organization, the Congressional Staff Academy, to better align with the needs of members and their staff. This effort resulted in new state-of-the-art classrooms, administrative systems, and most importantly, new classes to address the needs of member and committee offices. The team, is limit, the team focused its limited resources on introductory professional development for select staff profiles, including chiefs of staff, communication directors, schedulers, caseworkers, and new managers. Each year since its launch in 2018, the Staff Academy has grown its course offerings and its attendance. Last year, the attendance for Staff Academy courses not including required training, such as workplace rights, ethics, et cetera. The, uh, the attendance was 8,548, which is a five-fold increase from the prior year. This year, we're on track to exceed that. That said, we are not satisfied with the progress to death date. With continued focus on the meeting the needs of members and staff, we are doubling down on our vision for the Staff Academy to be an essential resource for every staffer in the People's House. This year, we are launching a new program focused on member office staff skills. This program will be led by full-time veteran DC and district staffers who have excelled and know what other staff need. They will be teaching others what they have learned, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the hard way. And they'll be recruiting their colleagues to train and mentor as well. Our team will focus on the everyday skills staff use to be successful in their role. So for instance, a new district director will be able to learn from a veteran on how to communicate with their members' priorities at a community meeting. A new chief might learn from a veteran chief tips for developing their budget. And a new legislative assistant might learn how to approach the rules committee or write questions for a committee hearing. We'll use a mixture of best practice panels, internal and external speakers, quick tips, emails, videos, one-on-one -on -one coaching, quick lunchtime classes, and traditional courses to provide a full spectrum of content to our staff. Our hope is staff will learn things that no one ever tells you about to actually get things done. So far, our small full-time staffers have made great strides. We are in the process of hiring four new instructors with extensive member office experience. We hope to roll out our new program this summer. As we expand the Congressional Staff Academy operations, I am confident we are in a great position to deliver even greater value to the members and staff of this institution. We ask for your support and partnership as we seek to develop and retain staff in the house. Thank you, and I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spender. 
Uh, we had to create the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress punch card for our second witness, a uh, frequent flyer with the committee, Brad Fitch. After this visit to the committee, congratulations, I owe you a free latte. Uh, Mr. Fitch uh, is the president and CEO of the Congressional Management Foundation, a position he held since 2010. He spent 25 years in Washington as a journalist, congressional aide, consultant, college instructor, internet entrepreneur, a writer and researcher, I'm concerned you can't hold the job, Brad. Um, Mr. Fitch began working on Capitol Hill in 1988, where he served for 13 years in a variety of positions for four members of Congress. Mr. Mr. Fitch, welcome back. You are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee. I'm grateful for this opportunity today to testify before you on the topic of congressional staff capacity. As you all know, one of the biggest challenges to staff capacity is high turnover. Many staffers leave their jobs due to this punishing schedule, comparatively low pay, and general public derision. According to your own 2019 House Compensation and Diversity Study Report, staff and member offices stay in their position an average of 2.5 years, while leadership and committee staff stay 2.7 years. One of the issues leading to staff turnover is staff pay. To be sure, most people who apply for a job in Congress don't do it for the money. In our research we conducted with the Society for Human Resource Management as part of our Life in Congress series, we asked staff why they leave their jobs. They cite, why they stay in their jobs rather. They cite meaningfulness of work, the desire to help people and their dedication to public service for the top reasons for staying. However, the reasons they cited for leaving have to do with low compensation and professional development opportunities. They desire to earn more money is the top reason they cite for leaving their jobs. And turnover on Capitol Hill results in a cost of institutional memory, policy expertise, and process knowledge. And this puts Congress at a significant disadvantage. Consider looking at Congress and the entire public policy policy arena as a three-way competition between the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the private sector. CMF conducted an analysis of representative staffers from these three areas who all worked on the National Defense Authorization Act. The key executive branch staffer had 30 years experience and was paid nearly $200,000. The staffer working for a member of the House Armed Services Committee had four years experience and was paid one third that. And the lobbyist working for the defense contractor had worked on the bill 30 years and was paid 10 times what the House legislative assistant was paid. Put simply, Congress is significantly overmatched in the public policy arena. With that context in mind, CMF provided 11 recommendations in its written testimony, and we'd like to highlight five here today. First, increase the member's representational allowance by 20%. And this change, by the way, is not really an increase, but just rather a correction for the years the House cut its own budget. To make the House more competitive for hiring outstanding employees, it should consider an actual increase in pay for staff. Second, establish a salary threshold for junior staff. Too many congressional staffers have to take a second job just to make ends meet. A minimum salary floor would ensure a living wage for your employees. Third, consider a recommendation related to overtime pay in Congress, or to be more accurate, the lack of overtime pay. As this committee knows, the Congressional Accountability Act applies certain rights and protections of the Fair Labor Standards Act to congressional staff. The House may need to make some changes to ensure that the institution is following the intended purpose of the Congressional Accountability Act. Specifically, the Department of Labor recently changed the minimum salary threshold for overtime eligibility to just over $35,000. We urge the committee to thoroughly examine this issue and make recommendations to the House to ensure that the institution is not only living up to the letter of the Congressional Accountability Act, but the spirit of the act as well. Fourth, Increase the budget for the Congressional Staff Academy. Initially under the leadership of CAO Phil Kiko and now under CAO Catherine Spinder, the House has made a gigantic leap forward to enhance professional development opportunities for staff. The establishment of the Academy and the plans the current CAO has for its growth are quite simply the most important and most consequential steps the House has ever taken to improve professionalism, job retention, and effectiveness for those who serve in Congress. Fifth, the House should also consider changing the student loan repayment program so that all staff have equal opportunity to equal benefits. Currently, each office receives the same amount, regardless of how many eligible employees it has, and independently determines how to distribute those funds. We recommend changing the student loan program to replicate transit and health care benefits. Finally, for the House and Senate to genuinely address the challenges to staff capacity, the institution must change its culture. 
Too often, given the extraordinary demands on the job, staff are viewed as easily expendable and easily replaced. This not only has a tangible negative impact on the institution of Congress, it exacts a terrible toll on these amazing public servants. A recent news story looked at the insurrection of January 6 and the aftermath impact on the attack on congressional staff. One congressional staffer said in the article this, staff in general have a feeling like they're being invisible, like nobody is looking out for us. Staff are the lifeblood of this institution and the culture needs to change and treat them accordingly. This committee has been an oasis of constructive thinking on how to improve the institution of Congress and your work can create a transformational change that will not only impact the people who work on Capitol Hill, but will create a legislative institution to better serve our nation. And as this chairman and vice chairman have wisely pointed out on many occasions, ultimately your mission is to enhance the product and services you deliver to your principal stakeholder, the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fitch. Uh, our next witness is Aaron Jones, the Director of Congressional Relations at the Wilson Center, which runs highly regarded trainings and professional development programs for congressional staff. Previously, Mr. Jones served for eight years in the office of Representative Hal Rogers. His expertise is in federal budgeting, the appropriations process, legislative history, and US politics. Mr. Jones, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for asking me to testify before you today. As the Chairman said, I certainly currently serve as the Director of Congressional Relations for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a federal trust instrumentality created by Congress in 1968 to provide a place for scholarship, open debate, and actionable ideas that the legislative branch can use to create policy. We do not advocate positions, rather, our job is to provide Congress with the expertise that you need in order to make informed decisions and take educated votes on the issues our nation faces. Through the policy education programs that we run at the Wilson Center, we know that there are men and women within this institution who care deeply about growing professionally and they care deeply about this country and they want to work with the other side to find common ground. This may not be something that the media likes to report on, but that doesn't mean it isn't happening. Our job as people who care about our country and this institution is to continue to provide these opportunities and to make sure that we do not create a self-fulfilling prophecy where we say that there is no bipartisanship, therefore we must make it so. I served as a staffer for Congressman Hal Rogers in the mid 2000s for several years. And as a staffer seeking to grow professionally, I actually applied to the Wilson Center's Foreign Policy Fellowship Program in 2013 and completed the program. I traveled with a staff delegation trip to Mexico in 2014 that was arranged by the Wilson Center for a group of alumni for the program. I never dreamed as a staffer that participating in this program would lead to my becoming the Director of Congressional Relations and managing that very same program, but it's been wonderful to see the growth that I've seen in staff. The Wilson Center runs several policy education programs for congressional staff, the vision of which is to allow congressional staff to come together, learn, and grow. The core of our programs is the Foreign Policy Fellowship Program, which is supported by a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. This program targets mid to senior level staffers, consists of six classes held on Friday afternoons. Each session focuses on a different foreign policy topic and lasts for two or three hours. Participants also engage in interactive simulation exercises that are de designed by our experts. And these exercises place participants in groups where staffers from both chambers and both parties have to work together to come up with responses that appeal to the whole group. Finally, there's also a social hour, which of course this portion has been omitted during the COVID pandemic, but we intend to reinstate that as soon as conditions permit. We also run masterclass sessions on various important issue areas that are targeted for senior level staff. These classes take deep, deep dives on issue areas where staffers work for several hours studying it. So far, we've conducted master classes on cybersecurity, Russia, China, the Arctic, North Korea, and there's upcoming sessions on Africa and water security. Beyond these offerings, we also have classes on cybersecurity and artificial intelligence that follow the foreign policy fellowship models and the master class models. To date, we've had nearly 1,300 congressional staff participate in the various classes that we offer, including, I might add, one member of the second panel who will be testifying before the committee today. Upon graduation from these programs, staffers become part of an alumni network. We engage these alumni by offering additional briefings, forums, delegation trips to keep staffers informed, and most importantly, interacting with each other. As members know, the congressional delegation activities, traveling, 
they, with their colleagues, can not only be an educational asset for policymaking, but it also builds relationships and friendships that extend beyond chamber, beyond party, and can last a lifetime. We have heard directly from participants that their experience within our programs have led to staff working together across the aisle and to have either to create legislation or simply to have a sounding board with the other side as they care, as they craft their policies. After eight years of running this program, the Wilson Center has developed a reputation among staffers for providing solid nonpartisan expertise. And this is useful to their members as well as their careers. Many staffers hear about this opportunity for professional growth by word of mouth from their peers and from their colleagues. One participant recently told us that he had heard about our programs while he was doing interviews on the Hill, describing the opportunity as a professional development opportunity and perk for the job. I'm often contacted by chiefs of staff and other hiring managers on the Hill who take notice of our programming that is listed on candidates' resumes. And this is a very rewarding for us. I hope that I've demonstrated today that this proves that there are rays of sunshine through the clouds of partisanship that we're often hearing about. It is my hope that places like the Wilson Center can continue to find resources to maintain these types of programs for congressional staff, not only for their individual professional development, but for the health of a vibrant democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, we're now gonna move into member questions just so folks have a sense of the batting order. Um, it'll uh, be myself followed by Mr. Timmons, then Cleaver Davis. Oops, it just moved on me. Uh, <laughs> stop moving. Um, Phillips, Joyce, uh, Williams, Reschenthaler, and then Van Dyne. Uh, so um, with that, uh, let me recognize myself for five minutes. And let me start with Ms. Spinder. Uh, I wanted to share that I've been hearing good feedback about the Staff Academy. Um, it's obviously a tough job training people how to do these jobs, which you know, often require a pretty unique skill set. And um, when it comes to Congress, occasionally an understanding of archaic traditions. Uh, in the past, um, there's been some feedback of frustration with trainers telling staff how to do their job or without having necessarily an understanding of how Congress actually works. I guess I was wondering, has there been consideration of hiring staff part-time to just develop curriculum and lead courses? You know, I think the thinking is this could help pay our talented staffers a bit more and ensure that our training is based on current experience. Has that been considered? It has, um, and quite frankly, that's why we decided that while we are hiring these four additional individuals, two who can help with district office training and two who can help with on the, the staff here on the Hill, these individuals we are hiring are individuals who have recently been staffers at the house. And uh, we are hoping that not only can they help us in preparing some of the course material and uh, doing the training, but they can also entice other individuals through sort of an adjunct type program to come in and contribute in those courses, to add to them, to maybe do um, some uh, additional um, the instruction during a live training course or a videotape training course. So uh, yes, we, we have realized that in order to really make this identify with those individuals in the office, we need to have people who have actually done these things before and can talk with the staff that they are trying to train to make them understand what was successful for them and maybe that can be carried over to make them successful as well. I want to follow up on, on the training that you offer. I'm pretty struck that um, retention can often be tied to the degree to which a staff member feels that the office in which they work is investing in them and that their relationship with their manager is one of, uh, of um you know, a, a loving critic who's investing in them and trying to help them improve professionally. Um, having said that, you know, oftentimes in this environment, you have people stepping into management roles who haven't managed before. So can you talk about the management training courses that you offer and the feedback you've uh, gotten from staff who've attended those? And are you able to measure the effectiveness of those programs and whether they're having a positive impact on office culture and retention? 
Um, yes, I can. Um, we uh, have a number of leadership programs that we do offer throughout the year, both for staff as uh, and within the CAO, as well as staff management training and staff training uh, uh, for uh, those in the offices. Uh, we measure a lot from feedback that we get from the evaluations that are done from the classes, but also we have our customer advocates that are assigned to each of the offices. They provide us feedback. We understand that our evaluations over the past couple years have improved. And right now we are getting about a 97% positive feedback on our course evaluations over the past year. So that's good. We want to improve. We want to do better. Our attendance tells us that it is popular or people are attending. As I said earlier in my presentation, we had uh, this year alone, or I'm sorry, last year we had attendance of 8,548. And these were with the non-required training uh, programs that we all go through, like the workplace rights, like ethics, like cybersecurity training. This year, we have already trained 3,676 employees. So we, we expect to really uh, beat the records that we've had in the past as far as training that we have done. So we feel like that there are some really good indicators. Our evaluations are going up, training attendance is going up, and we are beginning to offer more and more training for individuals. Um, the LinkedIn courses alone require, uh, I think there's something like, um, uh, a total of um, thousands of courses that's available through LinkedIn Learning that people can uh, uh, view at any time. They're online and they're in seven different languages for anyone that needs something in a language besides English, they can take this training. Um, we get a lot of people that go in and take a variety of management courses through that particular medium because it's easy to go and online and do the training. So we are looking at a variety of ways to provide the training and we see that uh, we've got to improve in what we offer to the staff, which is why we're hiring the individuals that we are this year. And I expect the growth to be really good in the number of people that are attending and in the evaluations that we receive. So I'm Terrific. pleased. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, we've got Mr. Timmons and Mr. Cleavers in the uh, on deck circle. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to begin with Mr. Fitch. Um, Mr. Fitch, you, you referenced uh, increasing the entry level salary. Well, what number do you think is appropriate there? I mean, you know, $15 an hour is $30, $31, $32,000. Is that sufficient or where are you going with that? And I guess another question is how many people on the Hill make less than $32,000? Is that really a, a, a big problem that is, I'm, not, I'm not as aware of? Well, if you're one of those people that are making less than 32,000, it's a big problem because you're looking at, you know, ramen sure. noodles for dinner most of the time. Um, and and the, the number, I'm not going to uh, offer that at this time. I'd like the opportunity to research that further. Um, and I think that at some levels, it may need to be adjusted based on location. I mean, we live in the Washington, D.C. area. We did a little analysis, a quick analysis of what an entry level employee at the IRS would make as a staff assistant. And at the entry level, they're paid $38,000 as a minimum. And that was just, you know, we were just looking at comparative to the executive branch. Um, I, I think this is something that should be actually explored a little bit in with some focus groups with uh, some of your own staff and look at their experiences and how they are making ends meet with, you know, a $30,000 or $29,000 year. And I think that the, unfortunately, I do think it does require some level of a mandate because we continue to hear stories of managers who are frankly engaged in a race to the bottom um, to bring in the lowest paid staff member and they treat it like a badge of honor, which is just horrible, but you know, you can't, you can't manage all culture at one time. So I do think that the house having some kind of floor will address some of those deficiencies. 
Sure. And I guess the challenge there, I mean, I think DC is one thing because the cost of living is so high, but certain more right. rural areas, um, you know, if you're, if, if you're in a very rural area, it, it's just a different story for an entry level job, but I definitely agree. Um, we're, we pride ourselves on taking care of our team members. So um, it would be interesting to know how many people are working on the Hill that make less than, you know, 30, $32,000 a year. Um, I'm sure we can look into that. Um, thank you, Mr. Fitch. And again, I wanted to appreciate, uh, I was just looking at my email three, three, four years ago is uh, 2018 is the first time I emailed you and I emailed you at 6am and you got back to me four hours later and you said, I'm really sorry for the delay. And I just think that's, that's great. We, uh, we hit the ground running because of the resources that you offer. And um, I, I just really appreciate uh, the role that y'all play in helping helping Congress uh, really get offices set up. So thank you for that. My um, pleasure. Ms. Spender, um, I wanna go back to you uh, regarding the recommendations that we made in the 116th. Um, do we need to do something uh, direction through appropriations or are there changes that we can be made without any actual directive? Uh, could you just give us an update there? from the the last modernization committee where we are making progress on that we're prepared at any time to sit down and begin uh, updating you on the progress we are making the yesterday in fact we rolled out digital signatures for congressional offices to use through our new quill program and uh, that is one of the things that we have been working on from a modernization standpoint we have uh, probably about 20, 25 projects that are ongoing that we think is consistent with the request that was made in the 116th. And we are tracking all the others to make sure that we have them prioritized and ready to go as soon as we have staffing available to, to start working on those. So we're making good progress. And we would love to sit down with you at any time and review those uh, those projects. Sure, thank you, thank you so much for that. We really appreciate all your hard work, and just please use us as a resource um, to to get you whatever additional um, help you need to to get all of these things uh, implemented. We really do appreciate um, all your hard work. One specific area. Could you talk about the the recommendation regarding onboarding training for new employees? Has has that uh, have we made any progress there? Uh, well, our HR department has developed a human capital um, and, uh, program where part of that is recruiting and ensuring that we have recruiting that is available, is sent out to a variety of different groups uh, to ensure that we have a broad diversity of individuals that are applying for our courses and a much greater audience of recruiting firms that we can pull from. So we are seeing that uh, from a recruiting standpoint, we are uh, seeing many more uh, applications and many more submissions than what we have in the past. Um, sure. I, I don't want to take, I'm, I'm over my time. I apologize. We're going to definitely uh, get with you soon. But um, again, thank you so much for all your hard work. And we look forward to helping you through this process. Thank you. I thank you for that. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair Timmons. Uh, next up, Mr. Cleaver and uh, Mr. Davis is in the on-deck circle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Timmons, for, for both of you for the, uh, this meeting uh, today. I'd like for, for all three of our uh, witnesses to respond to this question. Uh, how do you think that the American public would respond to the members of Congress adequately uh, paying its workforce? What would be the response of the taxpayers in, in your, in your uh, estimation? Well, I'll take the first one. And I think you, you obviously teed up Congressman, the, that's one of the challenges. Anytime Congress, quote unquote, spends money on itself, it is uh, criticized, uh, sometimes unfairly. Um, I remember looking at the, when they spent money on the Capitol Visitor Center, we even had critics and I'm like, what about the word visitor do you not get? It's not a Congress, but mm -hmm. there are ways to address that. So if you didn't want to see an overall increase in the overall either legislative branch budget, you could shift costs within the legislative branch. For example, certain institutional costs could cover things that are currently paid for by the MRA 
everything from hardware, software. Um, there's more creative ways to do it. And I think that may be one of the ways that this committee may want to recommend. So it doesn't have to, to eventually take the hit. But in the end, the legislative branch has to get on an equal footing with the executive branch. And that may mean uh, a, an increase in pay. But I think you do need to look at internally how the numbers go, because a lot of the money, as you know, is being eaten up in security and in building costs at this point in the ledge branch. And that's got to be addressed at some point or else that is going to continue to suck money out of the personal committee and leadership offices. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to, to take a stab at it as well. I, uh, I think that one of the problems is a perception that uh, of the American public that staff are paid a whole lot more. Uh, I don't think that there is a recognition that there's a low pay in, in, in Congress. And also, I think there's also a perception the big offices with a whole bunch of people working and they're working nine to five and that's it. I can't tell you how often I pick up the phone at six, eight o'clock at night when a constituent calls in and they're shocked that somebody's answering the phone. Um, but I think there's a perception problem that needs to, th this is something that needs to be talked about, not create. And, you know, I worked for Congressman Hal Rogers when he was chairman of the appropriations committee and those that are on the committee that are on the uh, also on the appropriations committee can remember well the circular firing squad that we had uh, during the last recession uh, exactly. in uh, what Mr. Fitch called the race to the bottom on, on congressional staff salaries. We're still recovering from that member member pay and our member representational allowances are still recovering from that uh, to where I, I know staffers today who are being paid as much as I was when I started in 2006, 2007. So uh, it's a, uh, but I think perception among constituents, we can show constituents what he is on Little Hill. Thank you, Ms. Jones Wilson. Uh, I'll, I'll add just a few comments. I mean, uh, I think that we can provide excellent staff training, all three of us can, who are speaking today, but really and truly, uh, if the staff can't afford to live in DC and they can't afford to, um, to function uh, with the salary they have, then that's got to be addressed. I, I think that that's gonna be the way it's presented to the American people. We have to give them the ability, if they're going to work here, to be able to make the money they need to live. And all of the great training we provide and everything will certainly help them be able to function in their job. But still, at the end of the day, if they, if they are not able to find a place to live that they can afford, that's going to cause uh, retention to suffer. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Fitch, I was at the White House two weeks ago uh, for a, a meeting, um, and uh, I, I looked around the room uh, in the Oval Office with, with a number of about eight members from, from both sides of the aisle, and I looked at the people who were standing around the walls, the people who, had, who worked over in the White House, and every single one of them, every one that was in that room, once worked over in the House of Representatives. Uh, Shawana Goff, for example, uh, was the floor manager that, that I think, I, you know, Mr. Kilmer would, would, would remember easily. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, these are thieves over here in the White House. These are convicts. They, they are stealing all of our people. Now, I didn't say that to the president because uh, uh, I have a lot more sense than that. But, but my goodness, I, I thought it was horrible. I, my time is up, but uh, you had mentioned, Mr. Fitch, about, uh, about you know, the, the, this branch of government, government falling behind. And one of the reasons is that we train people over here for a year or two, and then the, the White House, I don't care what administration it is, they steal them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. Next up, we've got Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and all the witnesses. Uh, great discussion. I, I do want to uh, 
also echo some of the comments that uh, were made by Derek, by the chair, in regards to the Congressional Staff Academy, Ms. Spindor. I think, uh, you know, looking ahead, we'll be in a much better position to retain staff and, and be able to move forward. And, and as many of you know, on this, on this committee, we have former staffers that are now members of Congress. So uh, this is a committee that I hope will, will get a lot, of, a lot of things done to benefit uh, addressing the issue that we're here to talk about today. Uh, Ms. Spender, yeah. during the last Congress, we talked about making the CAO more of an outward facing organization. Uh, how has that worked uh, since, since you began? Because you know, I, I'm someone who believes a stronger, more proactive approach from the CAO to member offices is something that we can you know, have more members be informed with. You mentioned earlier, you have folks that are, that are uh, put in place to be our liaisons, but give us a little more detail about what you plan to do even more so in the future. Sure. Well, I think a big step for me was hiring someone to, to just focus on customer relations. Uh, Lisa Sherman came in, a former chief of staff, and uh, with, with her expertise and having worked in member offices, uh, she has really added a, a fresh perspective to how we believe we can move forward. And I think by uh, the work that she's doing to hire these new instructors from the staff, the, this is going to help us a great deal. But she also has some great ideas on how to market the products that we have directly to the staff. Because what we're finding out, uh, Congressman Davis, is that we have a lot of things that we've developed that people really just don't know about. Oh, you're right. And, you're right. and uh, I think that by having a marketing branch, an outreach branch, that's part of the CAO, we can, we can mature that to where we are providing information that each member office needs to know about the services we provide and how to get in touch with us and in touch with the right people to be able to acquire those services or, or get help with those services. We are also looking at major changes to uh, our technology group and how we are reaching out and working with each office. And I'm not quite prepared to announce that, but we're working on it, but we're looking at how we can provide more services, more real-time modern services to the offices. And you should be hearing about that in a, another month or so. Great, great. I think Lisa is great. I worked with her uh, in my capacity on House Administration before in the Franking Commission. Um, I'm glad you're seeing uh, her make a difference and, and put that office perspective in place within your agency. I look forward to hearing some more from you in the future and uh, sitting down with Lisa to talk about some of the things you just mentioned. You know, one program that I always highlighted when I was a staffer and continue to highlight to my team is a student loan repayment program here in the House. Uh, I, I watched some of my colleagues pay off their student loans with this program, but there were things that, that Mr. Jones mentioned about the lowest paid employees, Mr. Fitch mentioned about the lowest paid employees. I always was upset as a staffer that the lowest paid employees were the ones who couldn't take the full benefit because of the tax provisions that used to be in place. But many of my colleagues on this committee and, and other colleagues joined me in passing a bill that I authored that would take away that tax that tax penalty for up to $5,250 a year. How are you letting employees and letting offices know that now they can offer this same program and their lowest paid employees can take the full benefit without having to worry about paying Uncle Sam in the future? I know that our payroll and benefits group has held uh, sessions with offices I know that we have sent out material. Uh, I think that uh, it's a great point. We need to do more in that area to make them aware of that. I think with uh, the way we've been working remotely and everything, it's been a little bit more difficult to, for our payroll and benefits group to be able to get that message out to everyone. But uh, I'll take that back and we'll see what we can do. Well, thank you. Catherine, and thank you to the witnesses, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back.
Thanks, Mr. Davis. Uh, next up, we've got Mr. Phillips and uh, Mr. Joyce is in the on-deck circle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I realize I'm a little too modern for Congress. I do have a tie here, everybody. It just I forgot to tie it. So we'll get to that in a future hearing. I want to thank our witnesses and reflect on the fact that when I came to Congress from the private sector, amongst my many uh, unpleasant surprises, uh, was how poorly we resource our offices, particularly since we are the customer service department for over 700,000 people. And what saddens me is that we're a country that seems to regularly uh, undercompensate the most important people in our country, teachers and uh, first responders and police officers and firefighters uh, and public servants in our own offices. Uh, I'm embarrassed. Uh, when I have to review compensation for my team and recognize their sacrifices to all of us and to the country uh, and want to celebrate this hearing because, frankly, the only way to rectify it is actually a simple way, which is a little bit of courage, I think, from, from all of us. Uh, with that said, you know, I want to start with you, Mrs. Ms. Spinder, uh, relative to uh, professional certificates and professional development. I understand uh, that it's not in the public's interest for public dollars to be spent to further educate or enhance the careers of public servants. But in the private sector, uh, we would sometimes resolve that by paying for college or classes or professional certificates in return for a commitment to stay on board for X number of years. Uh, so there's a return on that investment. I'm just curious from your perspective, you know, what is the rationale on the prohibition uh, uh, that precludes us from paying for staff training and professional certificates. And if there's some way you think that we might present it uh, in, a, in a thoughtful way that could move the needle. Well, I think you're just mentioning that it's going to help quite a bit. Um, I, I, we do, uh, I know within the CAO, provide uh, quite a bit of additional training for people to go and take training courses that prepare them for the certifications. It has been our policy not to pay for the exact certification, but to provide them whatever training they need to be able to qualify for that. Um, that um, and as far as college courses and college training, I've always been a big proponent of that as well, having come originally from the private sector. Um, and uh, for some of our employees, we do let them go to training at MIT or Harvard when there are professional development courses that they have. We set aside training dollars to have them go and attend some of the one week, two day, three day courses that some of the larger institutions provide. Um, we certainly can continue to go back and look at the policies that we have around certifications. For me personally, having uh, a number of certifications, one being for project management and other things in my career, it is helpful when you can not only provide the training, but you can also cost, cover the cost for the certification because sometimes those costs are very expensive. Yeah, terribly so, I, I, I would agree. I, and I wanna make it clear too, I, I don't see public service as a path to become wealthy, but we should be certainly competitive yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the data. If any of you could share with us you know, uh, your estimate of, uh, of the gap between comparable jobs in the private sector uh, relative to the various categories of the, office, uh, the offices um, in, in the house. Anybody have a sense of you know, how significant you think the gap is between in the, in the pay uh, in, in percentage terms? Yeah, I can speak to that, Congressman Phillips. We've done research on that. There's, and it does vary widely. On average, it's about 20% between uh, private sector and executive branch, but it does vary widely. So for example, if you're a house legislative assistant and you move off the hill to K Street or an association, you're probably gonna look at a 20, 25% bump. If you're a Senate chief of staff, you're triple your salary within a year. Um, so uh, if you see a Senate chief of staff leaving uh, their job, you can pretty much bet that they've got a kid who's about 10 or 12 years old and they need to raise money to get them to college. Yeah. And that, that I've seen that happen on multiple occasions. But it's, in general, it's about the average is about 20 percent. All right. I, I see my time is uh, running out. Just, just a message to my colleagues. You know, um, 
I think we can do better. And I think we should be attracting the best and brightest to public service. No better way to do so than at least be competitive. Uh, with that, I rest my case and, and yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Joyce and Ms. Williams is in the on deck circle. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you, Member Timmons. Uh, I've got a little uh, bandwidth here at the House. <laughs> so I, I, even though my screen might be black, I, I'm still here with you. Uh, apologize for that. And uh, Congressman Phillips, I'm deeply offended on your failure to wear a tie. I get mine up. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fitch, uh, in your testimony, you discussed the level of vitriol flowing into the offices through phone lines and the internet has reached unprecedented and dangerous levels. Do you have any recommendations for the committee on what the House can do to better prepare our staff for handling difficult and even these some situ those calls, but even sometimes the stressful situations that might start to occur when we reopen? Yes, I do. Um, the Congressional Management Foundation actually wrote a short blog after January 6th in coordination with the American Psychological Association. So a couple of recommendations we have. First of all, obviously staff training and dealing with difficult situations, role playing can be very helpful. Secondly, we recommend that offices strongly consider during these periods of time changing their phone policies to have phones roll over to voicemail. We've had offices do this and a lot of members resist that. So no, there's somebody got to be on the phone. No, you don't. Because what you're giving up is you're putting that staffer on the front line to get death threats and all sorts of vitriol. And what we've found when offices have made this change and they follow up with the constituent two, four, even 10 hours later, the constituent's perfectly happy. So it doesn't reduce your customer service if you allow the phones to go to voicemail and then respond. What it does do is it reduces the mental stress and mental health toll on your staff. So I think that's one of the biggest things that individual offices can do and whether the committee makes a recommendation of best practices, but the technology is there for offices to do this and help their staffers get through these difficult period of time, which we just hope kind of calms down, you know, in, in a post January 6th world. Uh, well, I, I'm certainly in agreement on having that uh, break, if you will. I have a certain individual here in the district that uh, seems to call me after happy hour. Uh, and he, he's an executive at a, a large corporation downtown, but the things he says on that phone, uh, you're disgusting. And, you know, it, it's, and I can't imagine the staff having to deal with the same thing. And, you know, the, the trouble is too, is I think the staff sometimes feel like they're supposed to be that buffer. You know, I didn't find out this guy was calling and leaving these messages and doing this stuff for a little while till you know, they, they raised the ante and uh, all of a sudden they thought my, my personal safety might be in, in jeopardy. And you begin to worry about the effect on these young people and what, how we're gonna do, what we can do as a whole to try to bring the, the, this vitriol down. Well, I, I uh, will pass on any further questions and, and my remaining time back to you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think I speak for so many people that are serving with us today, especially on this committee, that serving as a member of Congress is an absolute honor for me. And as members of Congress, we're fortunate to have staff who feel the same way about serving our constituents. I know that my staff is top notch and I will put them up against anyone for the work that they're doing to serve our district. But for too many congressional staff, there are so many obstacles to coming to the legislative branch and actually staying here as we've been exposing and discussing today. From the perspective intern with the dream of pursuing public service, which I get those random phone calls that people are wanting to start to work in my office because they want to truly serve the people to longtime Hill staffers that are starting a family, too often we see people turning away from the Hill based on factors like income and how are they going to actually raise a family. And we have to do all that we can to ensure that it's affordable and feasible to serve as a staffer in Congress. So I am so happy that we're having this discussion today. Mr. Fitch, I know we've touched on this, but I wanna package it all up in a nice little bow for the committee and for everyone that's watching. How could investing additional resources in the legislative branch for staff pay, 
pay and benefits help ensure that we're able to attract candidates for congressional staff positions who represent the diverse backgrounds and experiences of the people in our districts? Well, that's a big challenge. And I think the House made a tremendous leap forward when it established an office of uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think it should continue on that path. And we're continuing to work with that. I will admit, as a nonprofit organization, in the wake of the George Floyd murder and the protest, we asked ourselves how we could help as well to try to increase diversity of candidates. And I think part of it, frankly, has to be an investment. Um, I did just a back of the envelope uh, look at how much money the Congress spends on bringing in diverse candidates. And this is back of the envelope, so don't hold me to this, but just back of the envelope, Google spends about 75 times more on diversity and inclusion programs than the Congress, 75 times. I mean, you've got less than 10 people focused on that. And it's a great start because you know what, 10 years ago, you didn't have any people focused on it. So it's terrific that it's moving in this direction. The Senate needs to follow suit and do the same thing the House is doing. But I think there does need to be more resources. There needs to be efforts to build relationships with historically black colleges and universities and um, build that pipeline pool. And the other great thing that's going on, there are terrific nonprofit intern programs because we all know the intern pipeline is the way to staff. And so you look at um, Pay Our Interns and College of Congress, which are two fantastic nonprofits that we work with that are trying to diversify the intern pool so that those future interns become future chiefs of staff. Thank you, Mr. Fitch. And just another question for you. Um, so I, we all know that it's important that once we get good staff that we're actually able to keep them and we want them to be able to buy homes and start families and send their kids to college. And you talked about that Senate chief of staff when their child is getting ready to start thinking about college, that's when they leave. So what are some of the top reforms that we should keep in mind geared toward helping congressional staff build long-term wealth as they start their careers here so that they don't have to turn away when they have these big life changes? Well, I think one metric that uh, has been mentioned here earlier today is you do need to have a comparison of what your competitors are paying. And so be mindful that this is a competitive environment. It's still the most attractive job in Washington is being a former staffer. I can say that it's still one of the best jobs. I did it for 13 years. I wouldn't give it up for all the world. But I do think you have to look at that, the competitive offerings. You met, and, and that means looking at benefit structure. For example, um, we've talked about college paying. Right now, it's a tuition. Um, it's a student loan reimbursement for the loan. Well, some private sector organizations, and we've just heard the CAO does this, actually pays for college courses, not just the loan. And so looking at a garden variety um, class payment program, which is done very much in the executive branch and the private sector. Um, and so I think looking at some of those programs that are in the private sector. And, and again, if you're marrying the private sector, you're much less likely to get criticized if you're doing the same thing as Eastman Kodak and Google. And I think that's one thing to look at because I do recognize that public perception is a factor. Thank you so much. And Ms. Spender, I had more questions around professional development, but you have given us lots of information and my time is expiring. So Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, I think the other members who were on and in the queue have left. I don't know if, I just wanna make sure that's correct. I don't see them popping up. Um, uh, does any member of the committee have any other questions for this panel? Otherwise, we will move on to our second panel. Okay, um, so uh, let me say thank you to each of our uh, witnesses. Um, really, this is good and, and meaty stuff, and I uh, really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. So with that, um, we will proceed to our second panel. Uh, if we can get them onto the Zoom. Uh, our first witness is Greta Engel, Vice President of Employee Benefits at USI Insurance Services and a member of the Society for Human Resource Management. In a career spanning 30 years, Ms. Engel has worked with many employers in employee benefit plan consulting, funding alternatives, regulatory compliance, and employee engagement. In the pandemic environment, she's helped her clients and HR colleagues manage new employee benefit challenges, including engaging a remote workforce, return to work strategies, vaccine incentive programs, and emergency savings benefits. Ms. Engel also founded an HR leadership group, which helps to address the latest HR concerns. Thank you for being with us. Ms. Engel, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Kellner, Vice Chair Timmons, and distinguished members of the committee. 
I'm so grateful to be here and to discuss the latest trends in employee benefits, particularly um, as Chairman Kilmer mentioned uh, with respect to COVID. I am here before you um, on behalf of SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Management, with over 300,000 members who design and implement benefits to recruit and retain top talent worldwide. SHRM research routinely finds that benefits are an important part to an employee's overall job satisfaction. They can improve productivity, but also reduce turnover. Um, and again, in the private sector, employee benefits make up approximately one third of the total compensation costs. So therefore, engaging in a strategic benefits plan to maximize that return on investment is something that HR practitioners are, are, are tasked with. Um, again, it's also a, a highly effective recruitment and retention tool. For the first time in history, we now have five generations of workers side by side, each with vastly different benefit needs. Meanwhile, employers continue to make benefits changes to support their workforce during the pandemic. Prior to, salaries in the private sector remained flat for more than 10 years. While the pandemic has exacerbated this challenge, it's also led us into new opportunities. Employers and employees alike have incurred financial hardships, underscoring the importance of financial stability. As a result, more employers are implementing or considering financial wellness programs and benefits like employer provided educational assistance, including student loan repayment as a benefit. Um, emergency savings accounts, again, um, are often with matching employer contributions. Benefits like educational assistance can be used for employees pursuing uh, opportunities to upskill themselves or reskill as they return to physical work. Those same actions that uh, went down at the ballot box. Oops, there we go. Please continue. Sure. Ultimately, these strategies will extend beyond the workplace um, and allow employees to pursue better livelihoods for themselves, their families, and future generations. In surveys, millennials tend to value benefits more than other generations. Some analysts have predicted that this preference will cause the trend to more benefits to continue as baby boomers leave our workforce and our nation recovers from the pandemic. A few of the latest trends in benefits uh, start with healthcare. Uh, the bottom line is that the private sector is moving more towards a value-based system where we're looking to actually measure uh, the performance of provider networks for both quality and cost um, and offer lower uh, out-of-pocket costs to employees. Employees are, employers are also adding in new incentives such as um, getting MRIs from a cost-effective center. Again, there's no clinical difference from one MRI to another, but they can have vastly, um, vastly different financial uh, costs. Um, again, that's more out of pocket spend saved for the employee. Continuing popularity are also HSAs, uh, health savings accounts, which make up um, most of my uh, employer clients today. And there's often a matching contribution for those. Uh, mental health, again, you covered it earlier, but 117 million Americans are facing shortage in mental health care providers, and we're seeing a significant value and an uptick with respect to mental health providers via teleweb. Prior to the pandemic, in our own clients, USI saw approximately 12% um, who were on antidepressants, with only 3% having been formally diagnosed by a mental health care professional. So we are turning to drugs um, more than service. During COVID, medications in our, in our uh, data spiked to 18% of employees, and that may become our new benchmark. Um, even before the pandemic, flexibility and leave were on the rise with more organizations trying to offer some uh, new programs. Paternity and uh, maternity pay is something that we've seen an uptick in as well. Um, Americans are waiting longer to begin their families. And one of the biggest things that I'm seeing now is in, in infertility, but also adoption programs. Um, again, in vitro fertilization jumped just 19% uh, in, in 2019, but 29% um, back in 2020. These are just a few of the trends that we're seeing um, in the world of the workplace. And again, commend you for what you've done in student uh, loan repayment programs and um, retaining top talent is something that we're both committed to. SHRM welcomes the opportunity to be a resource to you and together we can build better workplaces and create a better world. I look forward to your questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Engel. You stuck the landing at five minutes. Good job. Uh, our next witness on this panel is Linnell Ruckert. Ms. Ruckert served as then Majority Whip Steve Scalise's Chief of Staff for eight years. She began her career in 2001, answering phones for the Energy and Commerce Committee and departed in 2016 as the highest ranking House female staffer on Capitol Hill. During her DC tenure, she worked with Congress and the White House to develop and execute strategy on major trade, healthcare, and tax issues. Since returning to Louisiana, she has served as the Chief of Staff to Attorney General Jeff Landry and as the Assistant State Treasurer. Ms. Ruckert, you are now recognized for five minutes. Greetings, my name is Linnell Ruckert. I spent 15 years in Washington, D.C. before returning home to Louisiana. It was an honor of a lifetime to serve in the House of Representatives as a Staff Assistant, Scheduler, Legislative Assistant, Deputy Chief of Staff, and finally Chief of Staff for eight years. On behalf of the thousands of House staffers working today and the legions of Capitol Hill alumni, I thank Ch Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chairman Timmons and the entire committee and staff for your efforts to strengthen the institution we love. I will never forget my first business card with the congressional seal, but the seal does not pay the rent. Paid parking, metro reimbursement, student loan repayment program, increased choice of on-campus eateries and the thrift saving plan are positive aspects of Capitol Hill life. Some ideas that the committee has discussed to further enhance the employee experience and which I support are, consider an optional bi-monthly payment system. The current monthly, payments, pay, monthly payment system can be difficult to manage, especially when living paycheck to paycheck. A floor salary and pay bans for each position would be helpful to recruit broad talent from varied backgrounds that are not so dependent on supplemental dollars from home. A human resources department that provides training to develop and retain staff, promote bipartisan events for staff to mingle, give recognition for years of service, and allow for flexible work schedules during work periods. As important as the institutional support provided to staff is the support provided in individual offices by the member and the staff who manage them. A positive office culture that invests in and promotes mentorship and the professional development of staff is essential. Those who manage congressional staff have the opportunity to make or break their staff's congressional experience. And this committee can help promote and strengthen the support for building a positive office culture, which help retain and enrich the staff experience. A mentorship type philosophy is a great benefit to the individual staff and institution. It's possible to incentivize junior staffers with exposure by providing opportunities to staff the boss for meeting and events, sending them to training to learn about issues and expand their knowledge base, give them an opportunity to travel to the district, to meet with real people that are affected by their work, establish a speaker series for new staffers on how to set up for success on Capitol Hill and beyond. It is also critical that we find a way to retain staff longer. The knowledge they cultivate over the years is a great benefit to the members and their constituents. Some ideas to retain senior staff are establish an in-house credential program aligned with the school for a grant master's in congressional operations or policy, reward tenured staff with bonus pay for years served, allocate premier parking spots for longevity as an incentive to stay, allow time off for deeper professional development experiences off campus. The institution of Capitol Hill is unique and offers endless possibilities. As a Hill staffer, you learn how to work with others to achieve a common goal, how to think proactively and remove obstacles to reach success and time management skills. I hope your continued work serving on this committee acts as a turning point where thousands more staff will have a positive experience on this shining city on a hill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. Um, appreciate your testimony. Uh, our next witness is Fran Peace. Ms. Peace served as district director for Congressman Wally Herger from 1987 to 2013. Prior to that, she worked for Congressman Herger when he served in the California State Assembly. Ms. Peace has also worked in the insurance and realtor industry and is actively involved in community service work, including with the Beale Military Liaison Council, which serves active military families and veterans from Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. Ms. Peace, you are now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chairman Timmons and members of the committee. My name is Fran Peace and I come to you today as a former district director for 26 years in Northern California. I was asked to comment on congressional staff recruitment, development and retention. Before I get started on what I believe to be the nuts and bolts of district operations, let me first state that my background is from the private sector, focusing primarily on customer service in the major retail industry of insurance work uh, and other realtor. And I was also the CAO for a small financial investment company. Working with people and meeting deadlines was my strength. Recruiting personnel in the district is unlike Capitol Hill, where member offices have access to a likely pool of candidates from the house resume banks. In the district, many times we seek a blind ad in the local newspaper advertising for a customer service representative. Bold as this may sound, we attracted a wide variety of potential candidates who had excellent customer service credentials. I was raised in an environment where the customer is always right. This attitude served our office well, especially as it applies to casework and field work. We also looked at community service and whether the candidate devoted time to service organizations. This is key to determine a service beyond self attitude. Outreach beyond the normal political science majors can be helpful in recruiting qualified personnel. Being part of a dedicated team is paramount to staff development. It is important for district leadership to understand the challenges presented by outside influences. Pressures from constituents, whether it be from angry casework callers, written inquiries, or from protests from angry groups become an unstable environment for staff. Excellent training must be available, whether it be from CRS, the management organizations, or similar services specializing on how to provide service with a smile. Being on the front lines, understanding what constituent service representatives experience on a daily basis is important to not only your district, but to the national scene of why Congress exists in the first place. And that's the, to serve the people who elected you. Once elected to Congress, your offices and personnel are there to serve everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, or Libertarian. You now represent everyone. Service is the only commodity or product you have to sell. Many times your district staff feel isolated being so far away from Capitol Hill. It would have been helpful to have regular congressional staff communications like newsletters, webinars, or back in my day conference calls to share best practices between district offices and even post employment opportunities along with helpful resources to resolve issues. This communication should be available to all staff. Retention of personnel depends on how well we gel with each other. As district director, we had regular staff meetings, many retreats and staff potlucks. We celebrated birthdays, bring your dog to work days, and we work to have fun. We implemented a trauma team to help resolve dis difficult casework issues. We would share casework problems and how to resolve the sometimes impossible. Webinars or even communication on the latest changes from federal agencies that impact constituent work would have been helpful for staff to keep up to date. Finally, it is of utmost importance that the chief of staff and district director get along, not only get along, but sincerely like working with each other. During my tenure, I served only, under only two chiefs in 26 years. I was fortunate to have worked with caring leaders. We had a special bond and truly enjoyed working with each other. Managing a congressional office is much like managing a major league baseball team. The manager of a pro ball team must be able to recruit players who gel with existing team members. The manager must also manage personalities, recognize pitfalls, and be able to resolve any potential problems. COVID-19 has given each of you this unique opportunity to rethink how we can do business post-COVID and for the benefit of all involved. 
Thank you for this opportunity to comment and I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peace. And our final witness is, is Dao Nguyen. Uh, Ms. Nguyen most recently served as the executive director of Future Forum, a generational caucus of young House Democratic members of Congress, of which I am proudly a member, although about to age out, I think. Uh, in this capacity, she oversaw the organization's expansion from 25 to 50 members and worked closely with congressional offices and stakeholders to develop coalition support for initiatives focused on engaging young Americans, empowering the next generation of public service leaders, and promoting innovative public policy. Dow, I'm grateful personally for your service in that capacity, so thank you for your work on that front. Prior to that, Ms. Nguyen served as a senior staffer to Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, a senior policy advisor to Congressman Adam Schiff, and in the office of Congresswoman Karen Bass. Ms. Nguyen, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, thank you for inviting me to testify. I spent so many of my formative years on Capitol Hill sitting behind members of Congress at hearings like these, and I never thought in a million years that I'd be sitting in front of you all, much less doing it virtually from my own home. My name is Dao Nguyen. I'm here in my personal capacity as a former congressional staffer who proudly served in the House of Representatives for nearly a decade. In 2011, I bought a one-way ticket to DC to start my Hill career with an unpaid internship. I landed a full-time entry-level job in a personal congressional office as a staff assistant, and I went on to hold multiple legislative roles where I oversaw 10 to 12 vastly different policy areas at any one time. Finally, I had the pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Future Forum Caucus, a congressional member organization of members dedicated to issues important to young Americans. And like so many others on the Hill, I enjoyed forming long lasting relationships with the constituents and the communities that we represented. I saw firsthand the impact of government each time we met with constituents on issues they cared about. And again, when we advanced solutions to problems that were raised. But truth be told, the longer that I stayed on the Hill, the harder it became for me to plan for my future. And I know I was and still am not the only staffer to feel this way. I felt the rub most as a junior staffer living in Washington, DC, one of the most expensive cities in the country. As I advanced on Capitol Hill, I found it increasingly difficult to juggle mounting financial and personal obligations on Hill salary. Like many other congressional staffers, I help to care for family, I aspire to own a home, and I wanna have a family someday. While I loved my time on Capitol Hill, I made the bittersweet decision to leave at the end of 2020 in part because I was offered a more competitive compensation package in the private sector that would provide more financial certainty and stability. I wanna make it clear that I deeply cherished my time in Congress and I have nothing but the utmost respect and appreciation for my former employers and colleagues. I was lucky to work in offices where I was paid a competitive salary relative to my peers and provided with opportunities for professional development within the confines of what the, these offices were equipped to provide. My appearance in front of you today is not about chastising nor criticizing the institution of Congress. Rather, I'm here because I love it. And I wanna help address institutional problems that often hold members of Congress back from hanging on to experienced staff with institutional law knowledge and expertise with the ultimate goal of better serving the American people. And that's why I, su I support the select committee's work in finding meaningful solutions to the issues of staff retention and recruitment. Based on my experience and the concerns voiced by my peers, I believe the implementation of the following recommendations, among others, would make a positive impact. Provide a 20% increase for the member's representational allowance for committee offices and for leadership offices to increase staff pay. Establish a non-binding pay ban system in the House that provides a salary floor for each position and accounts for annual cost of living adjustments provide congressional staff with opportunities to gain certifications, provide management training for senior level congressional staff, and last but not least, ensure the health and safety of every congressional staffer on campus. And I wanna make sure to emphasize this last point. The events of January 6th painfully underscored the degree to which congressional staff are vulnerable to security risks. As much as practicable, the institution of Congress has a responsibility to preserve the health and the safety 
of every person on its campus, including congressional staff. The congressional workforce plays an important role in helping members of Congress deliver for their constituents and their districts. Yet pay and benefits are often not commensurate with the work, the time, and the passion that staffers invest in Capitol Hill. These are structural issues that can often lead to low morale, high turnover of staff, and the inability of offices to retain and recruit top talent. Once again, I commend the Select Committee on its work thus far to address these issues. And I encourage you to execute on these recommendations and continue to seek input from both current and former congressional staff. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your question. Thanks very much for your testimony. Um, with that, we'll move to member questions and uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes out of the gate. Um, and Ms. Nguyen, I, I wanna start with you. I, I know that in this job, there are long days, difficult days, you know, and, and folks are able to power on because we feel like we're contributing positively to the country. But as staff begin to feel a, a sense of burnout and start considering a, a post capital here career, Hill career, what, what were the benefits that sounded the most attractive to you? What do you, what do you think would have the largest impact on retention? Is it first time home buyer programs? Is it the benefits that would help a staffer start a family like adoption services or IVF and childcare? Is it work-life balance? Give us some guidance as to what you think could be difference makers. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I mean, those are all um, really great options. And uh, whether or not these additional benefits um, are gonna help retain staff or recruit new ones, it's, it's a yes and no. These options would be great. And many of them are being offered in the private sector. But these options alone have their, their limitations, right? Sure, things like investments in 527s, fertility benefits, first time home buyer benefits, all of these things are great. They can help round out someone's compensation, but it's still no substitute for offering the congressional workforce with a competitive salary. Um, what good is it to own a home if you really can't make that monthly mortgage payment down the line? Um, if there are benefits that I believe are definitely worth expanding, I would really encourage you um, to prioritize expanding current benefits, uh, including the student loan repayment program um, and, and access, uh, and access to, to child care. And I know we touched on the student loan program earlier, um, and I really commend this committee's work. Uh, I, I know you all included a provision in the CARES Act allowing borrowers to skip payments for six months and avoid taxes on, on the benefits they receive. Uh, and it's my understanding that you'll look into reauthorization of this measure beyond the pandemic. Um, but beyond that, I would certainly recommend that the committee explore an increase to the overall amount that offices um, can receive and can allocate, because as you know, um, offices are limited in the overall amount they receive and make in available to indiv individual staffers. Um, personally speaking, I graduated college with a relatively small amount of student loan debt. I was able to pay it off within a few years of my time on the Hill. But I did so because I was working in an office where I was one of the very few people who needed access to that benefit. benefit. So I, in turn, was able to access the maximum amount. But I know from anecdotal examples that many of my peers in other offices were not quite as lucky. They worked in offices where every person participated in the program, which brought down the repayment amount for each person, meaning, the, meaning that it would take much longer for folks to make a debt um, in their student loan debt. So I think that's what that's what I would say on student loan repayment. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rucker, I, I have a question for you and I, I'm, I wanna preface this by saying, I don't want this to sound partisan, I, I, but I, I need your help. Um, you know, you saw Leader Hoyer and Chair Jeffries recently come out, um, I think rather courageously in proposing an increase in the in the MRA and estab establishing pay bans, as you uh, recommended in your testimony, and delinking member salaries from senior staff, so that hopefully Congress could retain senior staff. It seems like this needs to be bipartisan for us to actually get it done. And many of these things are things that this committee, on a bipartisan basis, have recommended. But help us, you worked for a conservative leader. Can you help us make the conservative case for doing these things? Well, Congressman Kilmer, um, thanks so much for the question. Um, I did advocate for the pay bans and the minimum pay for certain pos for positions. 
Um, and I think that's something that can be looked at bipartisanly. And, um, you know, there and other things I advocated for were management training for members and also chiefs of staff and legislative directors so that not only it's a compensation issue, but are you working in a happy environment that gives you um, opportunity for growth and training? So it's a, I think it's a combination of compensation then also best management practices put into every day working on the Hill. Anybody else want to take a swing at that pitch? Okay, uh, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I might even answer that question. Um, you know, I, I really think that we're spending so much money. Um, it, it is just beyond my comprehension that we would not invest in, in having the best possible staff um, running our country. I mean, it, it's just beyond my comprehension that we're in a situation where we, we do not prioritize that. So, I mean, I, I fully support making sure that we are able to retain the, the best team possible because that's the way that we're gonna get the better outcomes that we need. So, um, wasn't part of my question, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, okay, so uh, let's go to Ms. Rucker. Um, did you have a tough time retaining staff? In my office, we've lost two people, I guess 28 months. Um, they went to K Street and got a 50% pay increase. Um, we couldn't compete with that. So, I mean, it, you you have a lot longer history uh, of uh, on the Hill. C could you talk about your retention challenges? Sure. Um, well, Washington, D.C. is far from Louisiana. And although we had Congressman Scalise hires people from all over, some Louisiana people move to Washington and it's not what they think. So they're homesick and they leave quickly. That was one sort of junior staff type issue. Um, but then there's also, I think Capitol Hill is a great training program for any line of work you're going to go in. We had staffers that went on to become real estate agents, um, elected officials, um, own their own insurance agency. Um, because you learn how to be proactive, you learn how to be a problem solver, you have that Capitol Hill polish, which, which I think is when you're surrounded by smart, fast paced um, people from all over the country, you learn great, great polish. And I think that helps um, Hill staffers get recruited away. Um, some staffers remain forever. Congressman Scalise has two staffers that have been with him since 2008, since he was elected. Um, they, they may have taken a turn and left to go to private sector and then were um, wooed back because they missed the team atmosphere that um, he certainly cultivates. Um, so it's a mixed bag of, you're always trying to retain people and chiefs, my fellow chiefs would use creative ways to overcome the compensation and the tight office space by, you know, going out of their way to recognize their work, give them opportunities with the boss, and highlighting them, sending a news release um, when they join the staff in their college newspapers or their hometown newspapers, just to give them exposure. Thank you for that. I, I guess I'm going to add one more question to that. So my experience on the Hill was in 2006. I was a Senate staff assistant. I was an intern then staff assistant. Um, and I was staff assistant for then Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist. I, I saw him once. I saw him twice for like half an hour. Now compare that to, and I guess he's leadership. He was leadership. So there's that variable, but compare that to the house. I spend all of my time with my team and, you know, I have interaction with everybody. Is there, a, is there a challenge Senate versus House or is it pretty much the same issue? Well, I've never worked on the Senate side, but um, I kind of always felt like the member is sort of the sun and where the, the staff is the planets around them. And the closer you are to the sun, the happier the employees seem to be for the most part. Um, so we would go out of our way to make sure that even junior staffers, interns, we would do a shadow day for interns where they would spend the day with the congressman accompanying him to committee meetings and um, constituent meetings, just so they could see what it, his life is really like. Um, and just always looking for opportunities. I was the chief of staff that had two children, so I didn't want to be with him, you know, every evening. Um, so we rotated those responsibilities and that helped with morale, I believe. Sure, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Engel, 
Could you talk more about the emergency savings accounts? I, that's a new concept to me and I, I just, could you elaborate? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, there again, AARP put out a study, it was really uh, impactful where the, you know, the average American doesn't even have $400 to set aside for an emergency. Um, that was before the pandemic. So we know that there is a really serious issue of financial stability in the country. So some of my employer clients um, are looking at ways to have an incentive program where if the employee is putting aside a certain amount of money that that employer will in fact match it and it goes right into the employee's personal account that they own and they control. Um, it is backed up with a uh, you know, group of um, programs around training and budgeting. Again, I echo um, Ms. Nguyen's sentiments around, you know, if you don't have the money, it's kind of hard to, to manage the money. Um, but by the same token, there are a lot of uh, tricks and tips that, that these professionals help employees with one-on-one -on -one education. So at least they're squeezing that dollar um, as effectively as possible. So I'm excited that more of my clients are looking at it. I think that um, it is a really um, important benefit. Thank you, ma'am. I'm out of time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I want to thank all the witnesses for their time. Thank you. Thanks, Vice Chair Timmons. Uh, next up, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize. Um, uh, I, I've got a financial services uh, hearing at the same time, uh, but I, I, I wanted to say this is a very important hearing, and I appreciate uh, both of uh, the leaders uh, uh, doing this. I, I, in response to the last uh, question about the, the Senate, I'm not sure, you know, uh, my my, uh, my postgraduate degree is in theology. I, I've not, I found no theology that would allow me to, to believe that God actually wanted a Senate, but uh, there, there, there is, uh, you know, it's here, so I, I guess we have to deal with it. But uh, here, here's my, uh, my question, and I, I dealt with this in, in some ways with the last panel, uh, I, and, I, and this is up for all three of, of you. Uh, it, um, and I'm struggling with this issue. So, you know, I, I think that we are uh, weakening one of the, the, the weakening the legislative branch of the government uh, when uh, we lose our people to the executive branch of the government. Uh, and, and it's a, it's a every four year deal. And then once they go to the executive branch, then the world is everybody in the world wants them. Uh, and, and so uh, is that is that a good sale to the public? I mean, is that something that we can, that you think the public understands that, we, that, that we're creating an imbalance in the, in the branches of the government? Uh, if, 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 if our best, uh, or, or certainly the people who, 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 who get the experience uh, early on and then move to the White House, and of course, we have bright people coming right on after after them. But uh, they they go to the White House. It, do you think the public cares? Any, anybody single? I'll take a stab at that, if that's okay. And I think that's a great question that you pose, Congressman. I think it boils down to the fact that Capitol Hill is an American workplace, like other American workplaces. It's a competitive marketplace. At the end of the day in order to ensure that Congress functions and elected officials can deliver for their constituents, Capitol Hill has to compete for the best and the brightest too. And, and Congress is competing against the private sector as we've talked about and sometimes other parts of the government and it continues to keep falling far behind um, its competitors. In most cases, congressional staff love their jobs and in order to keep doing them and to keep providing a good service to the public that they serve, um, they want and need to be fairly compensated. And many of them come to work ready to fight every day so that families in their districts and their constituents can make a good living and be fairly compensated as well. Thank you. Either of you, either of the other witnesses uh, care to respond? Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Um, let me just comment on the district perspective. I don't think anybody just graduating from one of our local colleges aspired to be a district office caseworker. Um, what happens normally we, we recruit them and then they're good and we want to keep them, but sometimes they, we have to compete with the state capital, which is 75 miles away. And Congressman, you were saying that you lose 
folks to the executive branch. Well, we lose folks also to the state capital because they have a different system over there. Uh, they pay their staff better. They have step increases. They're paid longer or more for their longevity. And then those people move on to Capitol Hill. So it's a stepping stone that is, I think, part of the natural way things work. I'm not sure how you could avoid that because working in Washington, D.C. is very glamorous. Working in the district is not, but it can be. But, but if, if we paid more money, don't you think that would, that, that would uh, allow us to maintain those uh, bright young people, certainly for a longer period of time? Increase in salaries will help uh, keep a potential district office worker, but in the district, especially from a rural district uh, where I worked for 26 years, we represented 20% of the state of California and it took four or five hours to get from point A to point B. It's not glamorous being in the district as it is in working on Capitol Hill, there's always that glimmer of, of hope for a district work, worker, um, if they don't have other commitments to try and get to DC 3000 miles away. I just think it's the way the business operates. I'm not sure as a district director, I had any control over that. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, next up, Mr. Joyce. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, Ms. Pease, Keith, continue on that. You know, I, I agree with the casework is one of the most important uh, services of our congressional offices provide in our constituents. It's right there on the ground level. There certainly requires a certain level of unique skills and expertise. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that you implemented a trauma team to help resolve difficult issues inside your office. I mean, could you explain to us how that worked and what other rec recommendation may have to attract, retain, and, and train effective caseworkers? A trauma team that we had in-house is just like an ER department at your local hospital. When you have a very difficult case, and, and all of you know some of the difficult cases, you might be dealing with a potential suicide or, or something like that, but you have staff um, available to bring that issue to a conference room and we all hear about that case and we all provide input just as doctors would you make recommendations on whether surgery is necessary or for more x-rays and more consultation but if you solve the more difficult cases as a team rather than place the burden on an individual it helps to de-stress the situation mental health um, and wellness programs are an invaluable new tool that's available to many corporate corporations. And I think something along those lines can be implemented um, at the district and Capitol Hill level to help caseworkers and staff cope with the unforeseen or the high stress uh, situations that are coming along our way, whether it's handling an angry protest, we've had situations where people actually remove screens from windows and they come in, how do you handle that? Do you call the police right away or do you try and de-stress the situation by working with the, with the protesters? All of these things add a tremendous burden to an individual, but if you keep working as a team, they're solvable. And certainly would be a great exercise in team building. Yes. Uh, I, I agree with you on that. Well, you know, since relying on your expertise, if you had a magic wand, what suggestions do you have to improve the way district offices operate? Thank you for that. Um, many of your district offices are very rural and they're so far away from a major city. Um, traveling and reimbursement for gas, um, tow trucks. <laughs> I burned through four different cars, four brand new cars and logged in about 800,000 miles during my tenure. The travel reimbursement rate per mile was fair at the time. 
but I'm not sure how much it's increased. Um, you know, gas costs in California is exorbitant. You pay for insurance, you pay for tow trucks, you pay for accidents that happen on a stretch of highway. You're traveling in all kinds of weather. You're spending the night uh, trying to get from point A to point B for a meeting. Your, um, the miles in between um, is really exorbitant and you're absorbing all those costs. Um, perhaps a better travel reimbursement might make it more equitable for your field staff and your district director to absorb the expenses. Uh, you know, and one last one, security wise, what, uh, what security would you have between, like you mentioned you wouldn't be calling the police yet if they're ripping the screens off the building. I, I'm a former uh, prosecutor, so I think they should be calling right, right away when they're seeing the crowd. Uh, but you know, what, what kind of security would you think should be in effect then? Well, in our district office, we had, um, after this particular incident, um, we had a buzzer put in at the receptionist desk um, to alert the police or sheriff. Um, and they would come, but we also had a swinging gate where, you know, you have a counter and you have folks that want to storm your office, a four foot counter is not going to keep them out. You don't want to build a glass wall between you and your constituents. That's not customer service. I'm not sure if rolling your phones over to an irate caller, I think you had mentioned it before, and then getting back to them, you have visitors that come and pound at your door. You can't keep your office locked up. You're there to serve your constituents. However unpleasant as it might be, you have to work and get through it. Uh, right now, the, I think just watching the news, the environment's a little different and maybe even a little more dangerous, but there are still things you could do to provide good customer service and keep your staff safe and secure from unforeseen elements. Thank you all for your time today and your answers. I got more questions, but I'm all out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member. Thanks, Mr. Joyce. Um, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Kilmer. Uh, we recently had a hearing uh, relative to congressional fellowships. Uh, my office takes advantage of a number of fellowship programs uh, that bring um, uh, people from various agencies, the administration to our office. Uh, we cross fertilize, of course, but I'm not aware of any programs that allow um, Hill staffers to actually uh, take uh, some time in the executive branch or various agencies. Um, curious from any of you who wish to start, what do you think about that notion? Uh, first of all, why isn't there such a program? Uh, and based on your respective experience, you think that would be uh, a good offering uh, for Hill staff to have a little bit of time uh, in the other branch? I can start by saying that if I had to take um, a guess at why uh, an exchange program like this doesn't currently exist, it's because congressional offices are under-resourced as it is. Um, and it would be tremendously difficult uh, for a member of Congress to, um, you know, allow a staffer to kind of take whatever time off in order to go work in, yeah. in a different agency or whatnot. But with that being said, uh, if we could tackle the, um, the resource problem um, and an exchange program like this could be created, I do think from my personal experience, it would be a tremendous benefit um, because as a congressional staffer, uh, part of your job is also uh, dealing with federal agencies, communicating with the liaisons in those agencies to get things done for your constituents. And so to be able to have insight into how agencies work, how the executive branch works, uh, would be tremendously helpful. I appreciate that. That was my suspicion. Anybody else? Any other um, shared perspectives or diverging ones? Okay. Congressman, there's a... Let me just add, um, there's a different perspective from the district. We would have loved to have more uh, fellows come in from social security, the IRS, maybe veteran affairs, because they're paid for by that agency to work in congressional offices. That tool is very helpful and should be kept in your, in your 
box of tools. Indeed, yeah, and and that's my you know that's my belief is cross fertilization is always a net benefit to everybody, and and we should certainly seek ways to uh, if we're going to undercompensate, we should at least find ways to overinvest relative to experience uh, and opportunities. Um, another question for all of you is is relative to surveying. You know, we uh, Congress is pretty good at uh, thinking we understand issues and then oftentimes imposing them. Um, without often asking questions of the people that we would most impact. I, I'm curious if, uh, is there any uh, precedent for doing a survey of capital staffers asking what specifically uh, they want to see, what uh, benefits, what uh, amenities, what uh, other investments we could make? Uh, is anybody aware of any substantial survey work uh, relative to Hill staffers? No? Congressman, I, I'm not aware uh, of such a survey, um, and I, I think I left more recently than anyone on the panel uh, today. Um, but I will say that that, that idea would be uh, certainly a welcome one, particularly if it were, um, you know, provided on a voluntary basis, anonymous basis, um, so that uh, staffers, particularly on the junior level, are able to voice the concerns that they have without fear of a retribution. Um, I think that would be an outstanding idea and to be able to do it in a way where it is regular enough um, so that uh, this, this committee uh, and your colleagues are able to glean uh, continuous recommendations for uh, ways to improve conditions for the workforce. I appreciate that. Congressman, I, if I can uh, just interject again, I think that's yes. a great question. From the private sector perspective, just to rest assured that that is a best practice in HR. Yes. So um, again, getting the data um, and then making data-driven decisions for, for better fin, uh, benefits. Yeah, you know, one reason I love uh, hearings like this is sometimes some of the obvious that we haven't even considered, including this, it just came to my mind as we're talking that uh, we should ask the question of those that we're talking about right now and allow them to prioritize uh, what we advocate for. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll leave that in our respective laps and, and thank you all very much for your perspectives and time. Uh, uh, we're trying to make a difference and you're helping us to that end. So thank you. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, really um, great ideas there. Uh, I don't see any other members who have not yet had an opportunity to ask a question. Do any members have any additional questions for this panel before we let them go? Okay, seeing none, let me thank our witnesses for their terrific testimony, um, some really terrific ideas and uh, certainly appreciate it. Um, speaking of staff, uh, I wanna thank the staff of our committee for putting together such a great hearing with such terrific witnesses, really great work uh, to our team. Also feel somewhat compelled to thank my internet provider since I did not have any disruptions today. I've been working so hard on rural broadband, I didn't realize I needed to be working on suburban broadband as well. Uh, so without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thanks everybody.